This tutorial is sponsored by the 3D Coloring Book, a project specifically designed to help empower artists who are struggling with texturing in Substance Painter and to help show you that anyone can create beautiful pieces of art with just a little bit of practice and guidance. To instantly gain access to hundreds of pre-made professional level models and hours of high quality tutorials, click the link in the description and begin your journey today. To give you a general overview of the creative process that went into creating this scene in Blender. The scene is based off an artwork by Paul Rieb, you can check him out on ArtStation. In this video I'm going to be talking about translating a 2D concept into any 3D medium of your choice. I'm going to be using Blender. Uh, next how to create a large amount of stylized assets quickly and making sure the overall style is consistent in Blender's built-in material editor. A quick look at the technical aspects of how the mists and atmospherics in the scene were created and uh, how to create a three-dimensional stylized cloud such as this plume of smoke you can see here. Finally, I'm going to take a look at some of the key aspects of lighting an outdoor scene to get the colors to pop. So the reason I chose this scene is that I really love the, this blend between stylized and photoreal that it had. And uh, it's a really large scale scene, which I had never done before. And I thought it would be a great exercise for me to try and learn a lot more. Starting out, you're gonna wanna make sure to always have your concept open in the corner for reference. Next, I created a basic block out using primitives. The point of this is to get the composition and the blown out stylized proportions right. So try to limit yourself for now to just basic shapes. If you're having trouble with getting the block out right, you can always add the concept in as a background image and overlay it over the scene for further reference. This can also be of tremendous aid when trying to get the camera angle and perspective right. In scenes with such extreme angles, this can be especially important as a perspective can either make or break the scene. When making these blockouts, I like to think of it as defining the primary shapes. These are basically the shapes you'd still be able to make out when you squint your eyes, such as these houses or the simple castle turret here. Once you have your basic blockout done, we're going to move on to acid creation and further set dress. In this next part I'm going to be talking about how I made all the assets in the scene from minute to large scale. One thing I kept in mind when creating this scene is that I wanted to use as little assets as possible in as many ways as possible. You can do that in a couple of different ways. The way I went about it is variable texturing and using procedural materials. I'll be showing you what exactly I meant with that in a sec. Because this is a stylized scene, the proportions are all blown out and to really get the style down, I limited myself to not making any acids more detailed or smaller than the little pebbles you see there because anything smaller than that would just detract from the scene and ruin the style I was going for. Now I'm going to be showing you my basic asset creation process, it's pretty simple. First you're going to want to find some sort of stylized texture, you can make it yourself or find one on the internet, just be sure to use one that isn't copyrighted, don't want to get in trouble for that. Then first off you're going to want to create a plane and then scale it down until you've got something you like. Uh, UV unwrap it to fit one of the planks, mess it up a little because nothing's perfect. Then the material, quite simple, just use an image texture, once you got that you're going to want to apply a solidify modifier so that the board isn't infinitely thin. Once you've got that, you can duplicate it, change it around, maybe feeling brave, use a knife tool, cut in some holes, whatever, and then uh, change your UV. This is variable texturing. Uh, it's basically just using slightly different textures to give it that feel of uniqueness because all boards are special. For material you're going to want to use roughness, just plug it into a color ramp, play around with it till you got the values you like. And then do the same thing with the bump map, just plug it in there, slap it on there. 
Now this might not be very detailed and uh, doesn't always work, but for a scene of this scale, the more time you spend giving detail to an asset that you're not even going to be able to see in the final render, is all the more time wasted you could be spending on other assets. Another thing I like to do is have all my assets together. It enables you to judge much easier if the style, overall style is fitting with all of them, or if something is standing out, you can adjust it. And it's also helpful because if you ever want to reuse the assets in another scene, you always have them together like this. You can just import them and reuse them however you want. Of course, that isn't everything that goes into creating these assets. There's a lot of procedural blending of textures and materials. For example, for creating the snow on these, on these boards. But the reason why having a procedural workflow is important is because you don't want to be repainting your assets all the time. Having a procedural system allows you to place objects in different areas and they just work. For example, here I have these support planks. They were near a house and I wanted the snow to be melted wherever it was close to the, to, to the house because the house is obviously warmer. So I used ambient occlusion to determine the place where the snow melts and mix it in. Here you can see uh, the first step is just a simple XYZ separate, so the, the snow is always placed on the, on the geometry facing upwards, which is usually where snow <laughs> collects, and then uh, multiply it with some frost textures to give it like that extra character, so that it isn't all uniform. And here's a multiply with uh, ambient occlusion, and this one controls the strength of the snow, if you want less snow, more snow and then just add it over the albedo because this is still a stylized scene so having a physical snow material would be adding too much detail and visceral noise which is not something you want when your style is simpler and basically that's how I went about creating snow on most assets. Alright, this was personally one of my favorite parts creating these stylized clouds. You can use them in a bunch of different matters and we're, the best part is we're completely procedural, so you can control the lighting and colors. First off, you're going to want to just create the basic shapes using uh, UV spheres. You can use other shapes, but I find UV spheres are, work quite well. Uh, I like to keep them low poly. Then just rearrange them so you got the shape of the cloud you like. Once you've got that, you just boolean them all together. Now, having a boolean, you're gonna want to set up your lighting. Uh, you're gonna make sure you're gonna want to make sure you have an HDRI in the background. I'm not using an HDRI because it takes longer to bake, but at least some sort of colors that always add so much more, and some lights. Uh, make sure that the base material is still that you have a good base material. You're not going to want to add anything to that. Once you have your lighting set up, you're going to just want to bake this. It's pretty simple, just hit the bake button. You don't have to adjust anything as long as just make sure you have a texture for it to bake to and you have an object selected that you want to bake. And then there it is. It's pretty noisy. Uh, that's because our sample rate is pretty low the way I did it. If you, if you want a higher quality texture, you're going to have to increase the sampling, but that, of course, increases the baking time. Uh, I already have a high-res bake here, so I'm just going to use that. Once you have your texture baked, the next thing you're going to want to do, head over into the Physics tab and create a dynamic paint canvas, and then scroll all the way down into Initial Color, where it says Type, you're going to want to select UV Texture, and then the texture we just baked. And then under Output, you're going to want to put in Color, if you don't have a vertex color map yet, you're going to want to create it. It will automatically be called color, but you can call it whatever you want. Then you're going to want to select it here as an output. Now we have that saved and we can, we can transfer it to the cloud we're going to be creating later. The next step is going to be creating the little cloud puffs that we're going to be spreading across the cloud. It's just a texture. Uh, I'll show you the node setup if you want to copy it or come up with something of it yourself. It's pretty simple. It's just using some noise check textures and a radial gradient, which is just like a circle, to create like this puff. And then that bit of the top 
basically makes it so that depending on the angle that you look at it from, it'll uh, increase the transparency so that when it's on an angle, you won't be able to see like the flat puffs. Gives it, it makes it less look, makes it less obvious that you're using textures. This is a pretty common technique in the industry. A lot of games use this. Then next, we're going to be spreading it across the cloud using particle systems. I like to use three different particle systems uh, with very little size, about a thousand um, particles each, and uh, each particle system is for a different rotation, x, y, z. I find that just makes it makes the cloud look better. You can do it however you want. Just make sure that the rotation is different on each one. Now that you have your particle system, you're going to want to convert it all into a mesh. And uh, you're going to hit space and look for make single user and hit object and object data, make sure you have both selected. That just makes it so that when you join everything, that uh, not infinite duplicates are um, created because it's still all parented. And now if you head into material mode, you'll see that we have the shape, but the colors aren't working. That's because we have to transfer the vertex data that we saved earlier from the original cloud. Select face corner and B color, this is important, and then select the original cloud and generate data layers. And now, if we go ahead and go into rendered mode, you can see that we have our very own stylized cloud. Now, this can be used in a magnitude of ways. For example, uh, for the scene, the way I did it was using a particle system that um, emitted spheres and then converted that to mesh and uh, used that to create my, cl my cloud. It was like a puff of smoke. The mist in the scene created a special problem for me because the way the mist in Blender works is you use a built-in compositor and then if you select mist there and hit render, it'll give you a gradient and you can choose the length and all the specifics of the gradient and you basically use that to add mist to the scene. But uh, Blender has this problem where when you're using a lot of alpha textures, like you often do when, in, when you have vegetation in your scene, such as here, that when it renders, it's not really able to handle all those alphas and all the information, and it kind of just gets turns it all into noise, which is completely unusable for mist. The way I fixed that, here you can see in my scene that even in Eevee it has mist in the material preview, that's because I added mist as a shader in all materials. This is great for one reason, because you can preview your mist in the material editor and you can just look around the scene and see and adjust it however you want. Uh, but the downside is that you have to, of course, add this shader to every single material in your scene, which can get quite tedious. I suggest using it a material group, such as I did. Here you can see the basic gist of it. It's just some gradients, nothing too complicated. The second one is just one to add some mist at the bottom. And it's all controlled by this empty here. It's kind of fun to play around with it. And you can just fiddle around with it until you get the mist you want. This is my work ar workaround for the vegetation problem. And not all materials use the same exact mist shader. For example, the plane in the background. I had to adjust a little because it kind of faded into white as it came to a horizon. So I did that by itself. And the trees, I just added like a gradient so that at the bottom it was alpha masked. And it kind of gave it this look like the trees were poking out of a mist or something. Quite a happy accident. Another way to add interest to your scene is by using these fog carts. You can place them around your scene to give the mist more of a three-dimensional and more detailed shape and form. The way it works is basically you have the image texture with the alpha value of a cloud texture, and when using ambient occlusion, you can place it near objects and it'll soften the edges and you can blend between environment and mist. And if you layer it well enough, 
in your scene, you can give it this three-dimensional rolling mist effect throughout your scene that uh, takes your, your whole mist to, a, to the next level. Now, in my lighting setup, I originally had only a sun lamp because I thought that would be enough. It's an outdoor scene and it doesn't have that complex lighting. But the reason that it didn't work, I quickly realized, is because even in nature, there's often clouds blocking different parts of the landscape. So even if there's just a sun lamp, it often has quite complex shadows, even if there's nothing you can visibly see in, it, see in the scene blocking it. So I, I set up a lot of shadow blockers, so you get highlights and points of interest, and then uh, bring shadows into points that weren't that important to the scene. And it really, using this technique can give scenes of bland lighting much more spots of visual interest and take away interest from others to really direct your gaze effectively. Because if you can use lighting in a way that not only looks good, but also tells a story, then you're really utilizing it to its fullest. And that pretty much does it in terms of things I wanted to cover in this breakdown. Hope you enjoyed it and were maybe even able to take away a thing or two.